Good morning. This is your host, Lorraine Nightheart. You're listening to Venus Unplugged. And what we do here is explore all aspects of the archetype of Venus and Eros, Psyche. Pretty much the work of Carl Jung and uh, other geniuses along along the way. And what... Uh, I'm choosing to... We've been working with the four functions, which, of course, I'll be jumping in and out of information about that. But uh, the other night I had two dreams. Well, actually, I actually had four dreams. And uh, I realized that they were aspects of one another. One dream was the complete opposite of the other dream, which is a little confusing when you're trying to figure things out until it dawned on me. Oh, no. This is the opposite. And certainly what's going on within ourselves and within our world, we need to be able to understand the opposites and uh, not necessarily choose one over the other, but see that they belong together. And um, that's when I realized it was like, oh, uh, go back to Jung's book, Ion, okay? Um, And here I open up the first page, and there's a quote, which kind of says it all. And the quote is, there is nothing in nature that does not contain as much evil as good. Gerard Dorn. D-O-R-N, he was an alchemist. So that kind of says it all, right? But that is a very, very difficult position for most people's belief system or ego because they either want it a black or white or yes or no or their truth and no other truth uh, and we are at a point in the evolution of humanity and uh, for those few that can devote serious time to their own you know world and the evolution of their own psyche to shift um, consciousness in the world just takes a small group of dedicated people in whatever way they want to do that the the Jungian is is one language we can do it in, in many many ways but to not be able to tolerate opposites And by tolerating, I mean holding the tension, kind of like Atlas uh, holding the the world and not falling for one or the other is very, very important. So what Ion talks about is it's kind of the broad theme of of, uh, the opposites in the psyche. So let's say you have a recurring dream, but they seem to be opposite. What are they saying? That's an indication. It's like you need to start dealing with the opposites. Or if you keep on noticing in your life, you know, psyche is always uh, reflecting um, itself in our everyday life. We have to make a choice between two opposing forces. Well... Or what if there was a third factor? Or what we were talking about with the uh, the functions, that the inferior function in the latter part of life is the part that starts coming up from the psyche and we know not what it's about. It's almost the stranger within. So there's another symbol of the opposites. Jung also began to work with um, these concepts. Uh, it's an alchemical concept of the sacred marriage, the union of the opposites. But it was such a difficult task that he then began to say, you know, he kept on like trailing off, uh, trailing off in the sense of being guided because he he wanted to work with you know, this concept, this alchemical concept, and alchemy is like that. It's it's like, um, it, it, it's 
starts and it stops and it's in and it's out and it's above and it's below and it's it's almost as if you have to be uh you know really kind of get that rhythm and then every once in a while something jumps out and it's the aha moment all right so when Jung was uh, working on the Mysterio Conjunctius, which is the, which deals with the ultimate, most difficult theme of the union of the opposites, you know, he had every intention of writing straight through, but he continually found himself uh, obliged to deal with subjects that had to be understood before the opposites could be united. So one of his detours is actually this book, Ion, okay. And it and then he had to start dealing with the the symbol of the spirit and then he he realized that traditional thought, okay, or or the medieval mind as opposed to the modern mind. Then he had to move into starting to understand the language of astrology, of Gnosticism. And not just take the literalization or the dogma of uh, of uh, a Christian belief, and that what he was going for wasn't it didn't, in a sense have anything to do with Christianity. It had to do with the concept of the Christ figure, the archetypal concept of the individuated man or person. That's what he's working with. So it's easy to fall into the thought, well, it's about Christianity. No, it's not. This is about him trying to uh, unfold this powerful archetype that was brought up, uh, in a sense, born out of the collective unconscious. And then comes the myth of the story or the reenactment or the historical information. This is all being created through the collective unconscious. And it's very important to understand, particularly now, to not be driven into ways and thoughts and actions and beings and uh, by the force of the collective but saying what is going on, how does it affect you personally where is your yin and your yang, where is your shadow and light name it, put it down start to see what's really being triggered because a lot is being triggered, it needs to be, because there is a great evolutionary shift happening that doesn't have to be a disaster if enough people can struggle. And this is no easy task, the opposites. So the book Ion is the name of a god who represents the creativity of the time principle. And this god played a great role in the uh, Matraic religion and also late antiquity and in Rome. There are actually two famous statues in the Vatican of this God. So th- this God is a personification of the whole cosmos as a living whole, or in modern language, the archetypal personification of the principle of synchronicity. So these are cosmic laws, and he's trying to, uh, you know, thank God for him because this is a, a heroic act of getting and holding. It's like holding lightning or Uranian energy and Experiencing it because one has to experience these things in order to catch on. It's not an intellectual, you know, that if it's just intellectual, if it's just thought, uh, it becomes dogma. It has 
to be felt because the opposite of thinking is, is the feeling. And the feeling is what moves us into the experience. The experience then can uh, unfold knowledge and hopefully wisdom at some point. So what he's talking about in this in this book um, is very important. It's as radical and needed in our own lives. And I'll try to give it to you in the simplest way. And then, of course, anybody who wants to um, knock themselves out, so what the book is Ion Researches into the Phenomenology of the Self. It's translated by uh, R.F.C. Hall. And it's written by C.G. Jung. The original is written in German. And Hall translates it. So when he's talking, so any time that we are creating, which is every minute of our life, uh, whether we realize it or not, we're creating images. We're image-creating beings. We can scare ourselves to death with an image, or we can delight, or we can break through, or we can, you know, this is very imagination, has magus in it, the magician. So these languages in the language of Gnosticism, which is more the mystical, Gnosticism uh, means knowing. So one is a Gnostic because you have a, a living experience. It's not something you're reading or it's not a dogma. I mean, there's certain principles. Uh, Gnosticism is more in some ways like the Matrix, okay? Uh, the story of the... Uh, the bones of the matrix, which is, yes, there is a God that's kind of working this world, but it's not the ultimate. There is something far greater. And uh, we need to be able to kind of take the blue pill, and the blue pill, I think, is, is knowledge or understanding or at least the attempt to know that we don't know. That's the beginning not just repeating. It is time for those that are called, and they're usually pretty reluctant. I can't blame them for that one. God knows it takes you out of the the mainstream. And this kind of the the, the figure of Christ, uh, according to this Jungian, is the symbol of the self, Okay, and that's the matrix of the unconscious through the Christian era. But of course, what he wants to separate is the dogma, because that's just repeated, empty, becomes empty. Two thousand years ago, I'm sure it was fascinating, but that's part of what the difficulty is right now. Is uh, empty belief systems that have no living force. And this God Ion is a living force, as is the self, as is the unconscious. These are profound living forces affecting every single one of us. And so all the will in the world uh, cannot stop the shifting and, and image-making that the collective unconscious. See, we have our personal unconscious, but we share the collective unconscious, which is why things can happen in waves. Events can happen in waves. Or synchronistic events can take place, which is also the basis of astrology. An archetype is going to enter somebody's uh, chart or life, uh, the astrologer can pretty much calculate the time, what time frame, that that divinity or that archetype is going to enter. And then based on uh, one's uh, emotional, the way the, the chart is set up, is how the range with which 
they can work with that archetype or refuse to work with it. And you'll see, like, even in astrology, they've got squares, which are the, you know, 90, which is, once again, the uh, the quarters, the quarter of a chart. Or they have, you know, opposite aspects. You hear astrologers speak of that. So, you know, it's another principle uh, on how um, this works. And he had to, uh, you know, remember, as a Swiss scientist. So, uh, but he had a strong mystical side, as everybody knows. He's even taken a gander at the Red Book, uh, and that's why I appreciate so much of what this man has given to the world. Because, I mean, I'm sure the shamans in Peru and Siberia knew a lot of what he was talking about, but he didn't. He was isolated. And also what he talks about is, you know, that if we're born into the Western world, then that's part of how our psyche is formed. And although we can explore many, many aspects of uh, of religion and thought and possibilities, we're still essentially Western. And so we need to understand how psyche has unfolded during the last 2,000 years and changed enormously. And in this age of Aquarius, uh, we're smack in the middle of the tension of opposites. And if we don't understand the uh, or attempt to the archetypal self and the opposites, we're going to feel lost and hysterical and uh, and frightened because the answer is there or maybe the answer isn't right there but certainly the question is and if we get on to the right question you know in due time I mean it may take us our whole entire lives which is well, you know that's better to be living uh, and, and a question worthy of a lifetime than the why me question. It's so much bigger. It is so much greater. It is so much more daring and more interesting, this thing called life, and not just what we're being sucked into, which is very much the Matrix. Um, So... uh, Go watch that movie again. So what he what he talks about is the symbol of the self, and uh, that it's not the dogma that that's old. It's it's lost its appeal. The rituals have lost their uh, meaning. And so we we give a deeper meaning or we experience the meaning through the collective unconscious, not through just our personal egos. Now, of course, as human beings, we, we, wanna, we wish to just stay put. Why can't we just have security? Well, security is like uh, dangerous in some ways. Because we get that illusion and we stop growing. Or we stay so frightened to get the security. And the security doesn't necessarily mean financially. Security can be, does that person love me? Or, you know, what what is what is gonna to happen to me? Or what all this issue of security when to know thyself is probably the sanest the most secure thing you can do for yourself. And one's self, that's with the capital S, we have an aspect of, of the true self. But it's a, it's a constant state of flux. It's a constant state of becoming. 
And that's why this stuff can be so maddening because it's like, well, who's on first, who's on second? Well, it flows back and forth. And like alchemy or like the Gnostics, there's no fixed uh, star that we're blindly going to follow and then be disappointed in the end because it's like I... You know, I did everything they said, exactly as they said. I followed those exact instructions. Well, if the instructions or the commandments or the beliefs are not living and movement and unfolding and creative, they're empty. So it's, it, you're, you're not following anything. See, and with the alchemists and the Gnostics and the astrologers, you know, they're constantly working with the movement of the heavens and the, the internal and the external, as above, so below. The Gnostics tend to be more on the thinking side because they, they puzzled out and, and uh, meditated on the mysteries and produced a great deal of profound and original thought. And the alchemists were more on the empirical side, although, of course, there were individuals uh, that practiced both. And Dorn, which is the quote that I gave you at the beginning of the talk, it was a 17th century alchemist and also a very profound thinker. Uh, and so he puzzles out and uh, understands exactly as the Gnostics did yet he gives it in a very precise way. So this is 17th century. Now this concept has evolved and moved. The closest image I can get is, you know, the collective unconscious or, or even one's personal unconscious. It's like silver. You shine it, okay, polish it all up, and then it lasts for a little while, and then up comes the tarnish again. And that's pretty much the same thing that happens in, in in psyche, or that happens in our in our own growth. And most of all, it happens in the tension of the opposites of love. That stranger you're so in love with, who keeps on breaking your personal Ten Commandments of how it should be, until you knock heads or. It's like rubbing two stones together. You kind of wear away at one another and say, "All right, let let, let that let me understand that person exactly who they are, what their values are. The change will come, not through demanding change, or not that your ignorance of the other person hurts you." It's your ignorance that's hurting you, not necessarily the other person. Now, if they're doing something really destructive, of course, you need to have a serious talk. But in general, when when the heart opens that way, it will, so do all the wounds. So we see that in person, we see it in trans person, we see it in the world. Because the world is, it's demanding the, the psyche of the world. The, so, the world soul is demanding evolutionary shift with or without your approval. It is, it's, it's cosmic. And to stand before the cosmic evolution and that we're all part of it through omission or commission it doesn't matter okay so synchronistic events seem to happen at a time when an archetype approaches consciousness and this gives certain a causal connected images and events that appear or happen either to an individual or to a group of individuals. The archetype itself, okay, uh, 
is is a being outside of time or in a different time and is not dependent on either space or time. And the book I largely deals with how the archetype of the self, of which the figure of Christ is the chief symbol, or the fishes, the double, the leaving the Piscean age, the two fishes, one is the mother fish, one is the sun fish, S-O-N, which we'll discuss in a couple of weeks, what that symbol is. So, when this, when this chief symbol, when, it, when we start to assimilate it, so not only is it in the matrix of the unconscious, but, it, but also by consciousness. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to grasp or understand the whole thing just by knowing that you don't know is good enough right now. Puzzle. Ask the questions. What opposites occur most often in your life? Because wherever the enemy is, that's the opposite. Wherever this isn't fair is, that's the opposite. So if we can name it and not try to uh, make it whole or eliminate it or turn a blind eye to it because there it is and your inferior function can smell it and bring it up in your life and by seeing it as a profound gift that will bring eventual wisdom it doesn't even have to be in this incarnation because we're somewhere between here and eternity so don't worry about that part. But for those of us that are here and alive on this planet, and there's certainly many, many other planets and many other dimensions, because the whole gestalt is teeming with life and death, good, evil, at, together, we separate them. By not understanding. All right. So, and this is what the Piscean Age brought, and now this Age of Aquarian is saying, okay, we have to start considering what that symbol of the self is about, and we cannot get to that symbol of the self um, until uh, we at least consider that there is a self. Now, I'm talking about self with a capital S. It's in the, the, the matrix of the collective unconscious, the archetype of the self that is in the matrix of the collective unconscious. And next week we'll go into how the ego works with it because the ego sees itself as God, but it's it's not. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll look at that next week. But see, we need to strive because the quality of each moment now, living now, in time, the time we are in right now, for the individual, is so very, very important. And some of this, of course, sounds abstract, because it is abstract. As I said, you can research and you can uh, you can start looking for yourself in, in the book Ion and what, he, what, is he, what is he talking about. But it, you know, you you could use one word, and he'll use a thousand. So, uh, and part of that is that is his struggle for uh, the clarity. Now he he wrote these books towards the end of his life when he was starting you know to have a real handle on it so this is a man's struggle uh, so we all struggle but it's a valuable struggle and it's worthwhile so next week we'll go into the, the ego and the 
um, kind of again, if we keep on looking at fourfold, the ego and the self and the animus and anima and the shadow, so that we've got that fourfold self uh, and how that unfolds. If we start understanding, you know, we we banter these words around conscious and unconscious and uh, spiritual and not spiritual and uh, all of this, but do we really know what it means? I mean, really no. Not that we like to say these things as if as if just because somebody repeats something uh, that's usually just dogma. They don't have really any any essence in it because the essence will will catch you. It's interesting you'll start listening when people are just barking at one another. Their rules and regulations. This is the mess we get ourselves into and it's for us to get ourselves out of the mess or at the very least not unconsciously identify or consciously identify and be tricked into something that's not the truth of your being. But you don't know where else to go. So, oh, well, actually, no, next week I will not be broadcasting. It's uh, Labor Day. But the week after, and we will continue with discovering uh, this living God. Bye-bye.